Hello everyone, welcome to Future Cities Lab podcast. Here in Singapore, I'm your host, Andrew Stokels. Today we're joined by Sarah Watson, a technology critic and writer based in Singapore, and Oral von Richthofen, senior researcher here at Future Cities Laboratory. So in the process of uh, developing this book, or all you developed this project on the uh, tools here at FCL. So we have a number of different tools that are being used for urban research here at FCL. Could you talk about some of them and uh, what you learned from, from examining them? Sure. So we set out by mapping the tools and uh, creating an inventory of what tools were used to actually collect, transform, and visualize data. So we initially had uh, to define what tools were for us, so we've excluded say books and laptops and maybe even cell phones unless they were used in a specific way that was crucial for the research projects. So we did that and um, we collected a whole range of physical tools, instruments that we have, but we also realized we're doing a lot of things digitally which uh, serves the same purpose. So eventually we had a tool taxonomy for both physical and digital tools. And uh, this was an interesting starting point for us to examine both transdisciplinary research projects, but also synergies amongst different research groups at FCL. And I think we've found some interesting links. So could you talk about some of these tools? Um, It's actually quite unique to have a research laboratory that's looking at lots of different aspects of cities. So we have all sorts of uh, different types here, from dresses used in anthropological research to giant screens. So maybe you could touch on a few of those. Yes, uh, so right in front of me I'm looking at the backpack which is actually outfitted with lots of climate sensors and uh, a kind of mini portable weather station. So this is used by our researchers as they walk about the city to measure data that is otherwise not available at this scale and at this precision. I'm also looking at augmented reality, um, GoPro cameras or all kinds of probes. So these are typical instruments that our researchers either combine or buy or actually build themselves in order to get the type of data that's required to actually look a little bit deeper, that to critically investigate certain phenomena at the city. So it sounds like actually in the process of developing uh, the research projects here at Future Cities Lab, each of the different teams has had to come up with new tools in some cases or actually new processes of doing research, is that right? It's kind of inevitable if you want to do interdisciplinary work or if you're looking at various scales of the city. Uh, So I'm looking at a bike which is outfitted with all kinds of sensors and this bike is a part of a larger digital physical interface. So you can actually sit on this bike and experience biking in a virtual environment. So, And at the same time, you can f- get the feedback from um, physiological sensors which are uh, placed on the participants. So this gives you a whole new set of data which is actually crucial for the mobility group as well as the cognition and perception group. And ultimately, it will feed into a larger narrative on how to design livable and sustainable cities. It sounds like some of the tools are actually shared between different projects, and this led you to actually investigate the whole span of tools that we're using here and the different relationships between them. What did this say about uh, larger processes uh, of investigation here, and what did you find from this study of the different tools? Well, we did our inventory, which was the base of this tool taxonomy. We also asked the researchers to specify or to qualify the tools. And we found that there were recurring attributes that different groups were using. So this um, gave us hints about tools which would serve to collect data, others to transform data, and others to visualize and communicate data, and others which were used to support the data mining process uh, to begin with. So we came up um, with a strategy to link attributes and tools and to perform a calculation, an algorithm, 
on it, which uh, is called bipartite graph. So this solves, it's an optimization problem, and solves this graph and gives you resulting clusters. These are particularly interesting because you not only identify the members of one cluster, <coughs> for instance, supporting cluster or transformative cluster, but you also see the backlink. So the tools which fall in the cluster are not necessarily owned just by one group of researchers, but they're actually distributed across. And we think this could be a blueprint for tools on future CDS research. So for example, this idea of supporting tools um, that are common across different groups, is that right? And, and those are processes that um, could be applied to different modes of research. So the supporting cluster is interesting in the sense that we see that uh, in order to do base research, you need certain supportive tools. Otherwise, you can't get to where you want to go. You can't reach uh, out to where the data is. You, you, you simply have to um, create a certain environment for data to be mineable or available. Uh, we also have a strong focus on transformative tools, which s underlines our efforts to communicate and to visualize the findings. So the large screens we have, the different types of projectors, all these are tools which are used across the research, um, across the lab, and that support the other end, namely transforming data into knowledge and communicating and sharing it with others. So Sarah, as a technology critic, I'd be quite interested to learn what your thoughts are on how the tools being developed at Future Cities Lab uh, relate to the challenges of actually building cities themselves. So the research that we're doing here at Future Cities Lab, um, the tools that we're using actually might impact the ways in which cities are built. Uh, this is something you mentioned in uh, your article, so I wonder if uh, you could talk a little bit more about that. Sure. I, I think this exercise in trying to understand how FCL works through the tools is a really um, useful and productive way of kind of unpacking exactly what's going on on the ground and, and how um, research is actually being done. Um, but I also think we have to remind ourselves that these tools are actually part of a larger socio-technical system. Um, and so understanding the system itself gets, gets at the people who are using the tools, the implicit um, assumptions of what the tools can do. Um, it also gets into things like methods and processes, which are obviously um, inextricable from the tools themselves. So um, could you talk about this, this system that you're mentioning, the socio-technical system and how it relates to cities? Um, obviously, the idea of the smart city is a really dominant idea in urban planning right now. And uh, a lot of people assume that um, Future Cities Lab is doing a lot of research in, in smart cities. but. Um, what does smart cities actually mean to you in this context of, of research? Um, do you think that the tools that we're using actually impact the way that, that the smart city is conceived? Sure, yeah. I, I think when we're thinking about the smart city, oftentimes we're, we're really focused on you know what's technologically uh, uh, possible at this moment. So even things like putting sensors on light poles, you know, that's certainly a new phenomenon, right? And that creates a potential for uh, urban data that we just didn't have before, right? So yes, there is like a very technological component. Um, but I also think, you know, there's, uh, I, I like to look at the work um, that suggests responsive cities is, is a useful framing as well, um, in part because it's this back and forth conversation from the data. That's It's not just knowing what's happening in the urban space, but it's also about the back and forth kind of um, feedback loops that are produced by creating data, responding to the data, um, and, and building the city based on that information, right? So that can be something as concrete as adjustments to traffic patterns, then you know it could also get into people's um, walking behaviors and, and where paths are produced based on people's cell phone data. Right. Um, or else you mentioned some of the tools are actually used for visualization purposes. So uh, science is not only analytical, but you're also trying to communicate results to the public, to decision makers, policy makers. So some of these tools are actually functioning in that way, right? Yes. Um, so we have these big screens which form the value lab, which uh, was invented by ETH and <coughs> is sitting in Singapore and, and uh, in Zurich. So the idea is to also have a platform which uh, 
allows us to foreground the digital tools and give a frame and a space to the data that otherwise would be hidden in you know behind screens and not would not be showcased in that way the fact that this is interactive that we have multiple possibilities to play with those that we actually develop our own software to run on it which is called senior previews allowing us to feed in geospatial but also temporal data sets and create not just scripted animations but actually real-time interaction with that data is indeed very very powerful I think another shift that we can see with the tools is that the first phase of FCL was very much concerned with generating data we had arrived in Singapore and it was not yet the open data society that it's becoming and now we're in a different phase where Singapore is more generous at least the partners that we have the authorities are more generous in sharing their data in fact they approach us with data sets asking us what kind of tools do you have to get more insights out of those and um, this is a very interesting moment at the same time we also see uh, coding literacy being built up within FCL mm -hmm. so researchers and programmers are not two different species anymore M in many cases r researchers learn these skills uh, programmers acquire knowledge so it's a more organic uh, system and this knowledge is also visible in probably 30 different tools that we've recorded digital tools we've recorded in this taxonomy and they also show that we're now able to address very particular problems with specific software solutions which previously were not possible because people tended to bring commercial software which has a broader angle to um, a broader question so I think we've we've uh, reached um, a significant point where we can both control physical systems so we can retrofit bikes with sensors and so on we can build our walkable weather stations and at the same time we can engage with larger data sets official data sets which uh, are now being collected in Singapore and all of this contributes to the advancement of knowledge about the city. So you mentioned this uh, idea that uh, in the past Singapore which is now seen as a smart city uh, didn't always have uh, as much open data um, so the idea of data management and what you do with all this data that's being collected in cities is actually critical to what's uh, perceived as a smart city or what Sarah what you call a responsive city the city is actually able to respond to the needs of people and data is one way to do that um, so maybe there's uh, certain limitations of data or, or actually the real challenges in how you manage that data so from my observation Singapore is collecting a lot of data all the ministries all the authorities are collecting data and now they've reached a point where uh, they feel the obligation to do something meaningful with that data. So this doesn't result in a data transparency that we know in the West where the public data is owned by the public but rather an inverse where the data that's been collected on behalf of the public by authorities uh, yields a certain responsibility f in doing something meaningful as I said. Now uh, it's not obvious what meaningful use this data yields and this is where research comes in because um, the, there is a promise that big data can give us insights on user patterns on distributions on maybe certain inefficiencies that we can overcome um, there is the the hope that data on a massive urban scale which is geo and spatial could give us insights on where the city can be improved, what works well. So kind of learning of and from the city by closely monitoring the city, I think that's an aspiration that Singapore definitely has in its quest to transform the city in a more livable and more sustainable place. Now, um, our researchers have just started to scratch the surface. Uh, there are some insights from groups about big data informed urban design and governance that try to use big data and compare it to, let's say, institutions in cities and try to correlate that data with user patterns and, and the ebbs and flows of the city. We also have visualization of the urban heat island effect, which clearly shows that there's a correlation of build form and 
um, an anthropogenic heat effect. And uh, these are very important for the Singaporean government. And I'm sure they want to take on these tools, both in terms of communication devices, but also the insights and all the narratives that are unfolding through these tools in order to inform their policy. Mm. Some of these problems are quite complex. Um, they involve different agencies, different sources, different uh, interdisciplinary challenges. Um, and so you could say that this is a part of this new science of cities, uh, complexity science. Um, so Sarah, you had mentioned this idea of uh, the tools as being part of the system, uh, this value system in a way, of uh, what the city is. So how does that relate to this emerging concept of uh, urban science, that cities are actually knowable, they're, they're objects worth study in their own way that maybe is different from traditional disciplines like history or sociology, which we're not necessarily con uh, concerned exactly with specific places or with the city itself. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think all this focus on what the data can tell us, particularly as this moment of, um, you know, the data exists, so what can we learn and what can we find out about cities that we couldn't before, um, leads to this kind of urban science moment, I would argue. Um, that being said, I think, you know, it's always useful um, to think about, you know, while the data is proliferating, there are still limitations to what we can find out about cities from the data itself. Mm -hmm. And that's partly due to, you know, the original uh, development of that data, um, what the original purpose what it was used for. Um, you know, the, I think there's a lot of promise of big data kind of just right. unearthing some uh, insight into patterns that we didn't even know the question to ask mm -hmm. originally. Um, but I still think it's worth um, imagining and, and reminding ourselves um, the the circumstances under which that data is actually originated. So you're also saying that within the research community, within Future Cities Lab, it's important to be aware of the limitations of our own methods and the tools themselves that might have their own um, limits with being used, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I think this exercise actually provides a new opportunity to reflect on what some of those assumptions and, and some of those kind of methodology limitations are. Um, and I'm really heartened by the fact that um, you have included things that are really analog and really um, uh, illustrative of how much you care about field work as well. So things like umbrellas and clothing and mm. water bottles, um, binoculars. Um, these are not traditional, uh, you know, smart city mm. state of the art tools, but they do tell a story about how much it matters to be um, grounded and embedded and um, thinking about impacts on actual people. Yeah, maybe to just add to this, we've been talking a lot about Singapore and we imagine Singapore as a data rich environment. But a lot of the work that relates to Singapore is actually also located outside of Singapore. And there we have very heterogeneous data settings. Just to give you an example, uh, I've recently been to Bangladesh and in order to get some data about, let's say, hydrological systems, uh, you, you, you have to be on the ground and you have to study it uh, because the resolution of remote sense data is so coarse that you can't actually um, do any meaningful research and, and planning. So um, one tool developed um, by the Urban Rural Systems Group is actually trying to bring together various data sets of various sources, but also various scalar resolution, and it always offers the best possible resolution. So you know, for instance, that if the data displayed there isn't showing you more, then this is basically the starting point of a research uh, project. You could say, well, my task is to investigate it and to gather more data. So uh, to work in these kind of heterogeneous data environments where Singapore might be very rich and informed and structured and organized to others which are uh, less structured, highly dynamic, and uh, where we sim sometimes don't even know what kind of data set is, is meaningful and, and necessary and required. This is where we default on sometimes very analog and old-fashioned um, recording devices. I also think that a certain redundancy in recording is important so that you can eliminate bias. So, um, but 
I also saw that some of our tools that we recorded in this tool taxonomy actually already are dated. For instance, the copy of Indicia here has a gigantic drone. Um, it has the shape of a kite. I was told that you needed two people to, to kind of launch it. So nowadays that drones are usually these kind of quadcopters that you can steer with your cell phone. This kind of technology is totally outdated. Uh, so even though Future Cities Lab is only nine years old, some of the tools are now ready to be archived in a museum. So um, <laughs> I think we have an interesting document as well of the evolution of mm. the research processes and also um, in certain cases coming back to drones and aerial photography an incredible uh, amplification of the possibilities in comparison to what was possible before. That brings up an interesting point about um, the kind of nature of technology is uh, now technology changes so rapidly so that what is advanced now might not be as you, you might be obsolete essentially as you're saying. Um, when you think about the smart city uh, technology that's being implemented, is it also potentially the case that maybe cities are too smart that essentially this technology, cities are so technical um, that they might be difficult to adapt over time as new technology changes or as different needs arise? Is that a problem? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think that's a great question. And that kind of brings us back to the question of, you know, how much does the sensor need to hold up mm. over time, right? Uh, a lamppost is a is a platform as they're as they're describing it, I think, mm. um, or lamppost as a platform. Um, so how do you build these tools to be resilient? How do you um, how do you make sure that the data will be useful ten years from now, twenty years from now? Um, some of that's a technological question, and and you know, in many cases, these might be remotely updatable, um, and it's a matter of software um, and not necessarily hardware. Um, but I think that brings up a really interesting question about. You know, it's not just about the data gathering, but it is also about the methodology and the um, larger system and its resi resilience um, in, in interaction. And so from this uh, exercise you did with the tools, Zorro, um, you actually gleaned some insights into new processes or new uh, relationships that might emerge uh, in the future right, from some of these different groups using tools. Yes. So. One was that we've identified those four clusters, um, analytic, supportive, transformative, and representational clusters. And it was interesting that these were found both in the digital and in the physical tools. So it seems like that this is a palette of, of, of clusters or a group of clusters, sequence of clusters that is meaningful to do research which starts at the base research level and goes all the way to the policy informing um, communication level. So th that's something that we found. Um, we found certain backlinks or, or we call them redundancies between the tools. So um, the Future Cities Lab doesn't stand and fall with one tool, in fact, so we could, we could also remove some, we could add some, so there's a certain flexibility in there. Um, it also shows that maybe the tool use in one group inspires a tool use in another group. So we have a couple of groups that use virtual reality now, and um, there's a certain convergence. So it's not that they were set out to have virtual reality in the beginning, but they just saw from their colleagues that this was a very powerful tool to conduct certain experiments, to visualize certain things, to have an immersive environment. So um, it's almost logical that this kind of, um, there's a certain cross-pollination, I would say, which is visible when you trace these tools and which has been unpacked as we looked into the toolbox. That's fascinating. So uh, Future Cities Lab and the tools that are in use here continue to evolve. Um, so this is the f second book of Indicia, but it'll be interesting to see how uh, these tools evolve in the future, how urban science as a field evolves in the future, and uh, how the smart city concept actually may change and may be obsolete, or maybe already is obsolete, but a responsive city might be the replacement.